Dr. Morey's topic for this session is The Doctrinal Errors of the Church of Christ Concerning Baptism and Its Relationship to Salvation, Part 2. As you listen to this information, it will be my prayer that God will increase your faith and draw you closer to our Lord. Glad you could be with us for this second part in which we're going to be looking into the scriptures. Perhaps some of the terminology may be difficult for you. I ask you to simply bear with that. We are in the rarefied air of theology. And of course, that word simply means a word about God. The theos and the word logos. We're studying the nature of God and the things of God. Let us ask the Lord to give us wisdom. He has promised that we, if we acknowledge our native foolishness and we ask him for wisdom, which is insight and understanding, he will give us such things. Our Father, we do thank you that you have not left us in darkness simply to speculate about the way of salvation, but you have showed us in your word that you so loved the world that you gave your only Son that if we would but believe in him, we should not perish, but have everlasting life. Help us, O Lord, then not only to understand and to defend the gospel, but to accept it, embrace it, and look forward to being in your presence because we are accepted in the Beloved. Bind the powers of darkness and sin in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grant us the victory, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Would you please open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 5. The book of Hebrews, of course, was written to the issue of legalism. There were those who had abandoned the apostolic church and had returned to the beggarly elements of Judaism. They had turned against the Christian way and had returned to Judaism. And this book deals with the problem of apostasy and with those who would cling to the Old Covenant as opposed to the New Covenant. And the writer of Hebrews emphasizes the superiority of Christ and his person and work by that little word, better. He has a better name, a better nature. His blood is a better blood. He had a better covenant. Not just greater, which would be a comparison in terms of rank and power, but the word better, which means quality and nature. And in Hebrews chapter 5, we read the following statement, And having been made perfect, speaking of the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, verse 8, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Now, if you look at this text clearly, it is speaking of the fact that Jesus Christ is the origin or the source of eternal life. And if we are to obtain the eternal salvation that he offers through the gospel, we must obey him. But then we have to simply stop and ask ourselves this question. While obedience is clearly here stated as being necessary in order to receive eternal salvation, obedience to what is the question that naturally develops. Does this mean that we have to obey every single commandment in the Bible? When the scripture says that 100% of you, that is body, soul, and spirit, must keep 100% of the law, 100% of the time, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, be holy as your heavenly Father is holy, does this mean that in order to receive eternal salvation, we must be perfect and keep every law at all times? And James says that even if we break one law, we are as guilty as if we have broken them all. Well, what does it mean? Well, comparing Scripture with Scripture, this Bible tells us that salvation comes to us 
by grace as its foundation. Now, you will notice in terms of the Greek, there are various kinds of prepositions. Salvation is by grace, and the preposition that is used there means on the basis of. For example, Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you were saved as the foundation. Faith is always spoken of with a different preposition that means through or by means of, never the grounds of. So when someone says, hey, Dr. Mori, do you believe we're saved by faith? I usually say, yes, no, no, yes. If you mean that the reason God saves me, the basis and the foundation of that is my faith, no. The reason that salvation is possible is through the work of Jesus Christ. The grace of God is the foundation. And what is the difference between grace and mercy? Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. So, for example, if uh, you would killed your wife in a fit of anger, and you were in the courtroom, you would throw yourself upon the mercy of the court or the grace of the court? The mercy. This is why a pardon would be an extension or expression of mercy, not getting what you do deserve. You deserve the death penalty. If you don't get it, that's mercy. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. It's as if you're a criminal, and not only does the governor come in and say, I'm going to have mercy on you, and I'm going to pardon you, but as a matter of fact, I'm making you governor for the day, and I'm giving you the key to the city, and you're not allowed to, you're going to be allowed to run around in the limousine and go eat at the Four Seasons. Well, that's grace. That's above and beyond. And the basis of salvation is always the grace of God, though faith is spoken of in terms of the means by which we receive it. And the reason that faith is chosen, and instead of one of the other virtues, like love or kindness and patience and meekness and... Have you ever thought about that? Why faith? Aren't there seven virtues, as the medieval scholars point out? Why faith? Faith is the only virtue that is empty of merit. Faith is simply the beggar saying, alms, alms. Faith is the man who is drowning says, help me, help me, help me, I'm drowning. Faith, F-A-I-T-H, forsaking all, I trust him. It's empty of merit. But you see, love and these other things, they have merit. Do you have something to contribute but the Bible tells us in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace that is upon the basis of this unmerited favor of God, through faith you have been saved. Now, if you turn with me to Romans chapter 3, and of course the book of Romans is Paul's discussion, full discussion. It's a passage of full mention concerning the doctrine of salvation. He is particularly anxious for his Jewish brethren and Gentile brethren to understand, verse 19, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under that law, that every mouth may be shut. 